All right, hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Dan Shiftan, Director of the National Security Studies Center at the University of Haifa, join us to discuss the Middle Eastern Cold War. Dr. Shiftan will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type out your question. Now, with no further ado, I'll turn the discussion over to Dr. Dan Shiftan. Good evening. I will uh, try to put recent events in a broader regional perspective, both in terms of the history of the region and the dynamics of the region. And I think that what we need to focus on is the struggle between the radical forces in the region and others. Usually there is a very simple-minded approach to look at the Middle East and say, Arabs on the one hand, Israelis on the other, Arabs or non-Arabs. I think we need to focus on the distinction between radicals on the one hand and the others threatened by these radicals. This is also the most relevant for the understanding of American policy and Israeli policy in the region. So in the Cold War, we had Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, we had Saddam Hussein in Iraq, we had the different Syrian regimes. After the Cold War, we have Islamic radicalism, both Sunni and Shiite. And recently, we also have the emergence of something that has its roots 30, 40 years ago, but I think is now coming out in full strength, namely Iranian radicalism and Turkish radicalism. And if you look at the Middle East, the most important phenomena are the weakening of the Arab states and the attempts by the non-Arab states in the region, primarily Iran and recently Turkey, to use this in order to hegemonize the region. First of all, we have in the Arab world two things, a weakening of the Arab states, sometimes Arab states crumbling, falling apart. But also, and that's very important and underestimated in terms of its impact on the region, we have the awareness of the Arabs of how weak they are, how much of a failure they are, perhaps the most outstanding failure in the modern era, and the understanding that perhaps some of them may not have a future in the region, at least in the form that they exist today. And this feeling of weakness and actual weakness, of course, more important is the actual weakness, but the understanding in the Arab world how weak they really are, particularly after the so-called Arab Spring, is drawing in two strong regional forces, first of all, Iran, and recently also Turkey, with an appetite to hegemonize the region. And the distinction is the following. In the Arab world for a long time, we used to say that it has to do with the weakness of the regimes. What we know now, what we should have known much earlier, it is the weakness of the societies. And whereas in Iran, you have a barbaric regime and in Turkey, we have a totalitarian, authoritarian, perhaps going in the direction of totalitarian regime, the society in Iran is very strong and a part of the Turkish society is strong. And these are two powers that have a history of being regional powers, and they're trying to hegemonize the region. Alongside this, we also have a problem with American policies. For the last 16 years and more, we've had two very damaging policies in the Middle East, first during the push the Bush era, and then much worse even during the Obama era, because they didn't understand both of them, neither uh, Bush nor Obama, that the radicals you need to hit as hard as you can. The mistake of Bush was that he tried to fix the Middle East. He believed you can bring democracy to this region, and Whereas acting against the radicals was a good idea, trying to fix it and to stay in the Middle East in order to fix it only created an enormous damage. 
Obama is even worse because he tried to appease the radicals. The radicals you shouldn't try to fix and you shouldn't try to appease. You should help local forces in the Middle East break them, undermine them, try to weaken them over a long period of time. And a region where the radicals are weak is less unstable than a region where the radicals feel that they own tomorrow, that they can hope to get stronger and stronger. And then you have a self-fulfilling prophecy where people in the West believe that they're so strong they cannot be opposed, and then they make them strong by appeasing them. So the problem is not only what is happening in the region itself, but for a very long time, we had an American policy that was counterproductive in terms of the needs of uh, this region. I think Trump understands much better what is happening in this region. He's making one mistake that I think is important, and this is vis-a-vis -vis Erdogan. He is not fully aware how dangerous Turkey is, Turkey under Erdogan is, but what he understands is that if the United States wishes to leave the Middle East in terms of direct military involvement, and to go where the United States is much more needed, namely to Asia and to the South China Sea, you, leave, you need to leave in the Middle East forces that can do what you would have done because they have a similar interest to the American interest. So direct American involvement is counterproductive. Supporting your allies, and much more important, trying to undermine and to break your enemies is what works. This is what work, worked for Johnson and Nixon and Kissinger when it came to Gamal Abdel Nasser. This is the only thing that can work when you undermine the radical element. And this is what Trump is doing with Iran. And I think that this is a very welcome change and a very important change. And here is exactly where recent events in the Gulf fit in, because it's much more than an Israeli um, Emirate or an Israeli Bahraini, and later possibly with Sudan or with Morocco or with um, uh, Oman. This is not the focal point. The focal point is regional. This is only part of a much larger regional picture that you need to understand. And again, the distinction is not between Arabs and Jews, not between Muslims and Christians. It is between radicals and those who are trying to build the Middle East in a less unstable environment and are willing to work with the United States and also with Israel. Now, why is Israel important? because everybody understands in the region, particularly after the Obama era, that the only regional element that has a strong enough motivation to fight Iran, and Iran is the greatest th threat to the region at the moment, the only one that is willing to fight, that is actually fighting, we're engaged in a low intensity war with Iran for three or four years now in Syria and Western Iraq. So, Israel can be trusted because it must fight Iran for its own good. And if you don't know if tomorrow you will get a president like Obama sitting in the White House, you need to rely on Israel even more because the Israelis will be here. They're strong enough to fight the radicals. They are, they are motivated to fight the radicals and therefore what we are seeing now, and this is the significance of what is going on in Washington tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, is to bring together, to consolidate the allies of the United States in the region who are also the allies of Israel. And we are speaking about two kinds of allies. Those who are afraid from Iran and those who are afraid from Turkey, they're both justified in their fears. And they overlap these groups. For instance, Egypt wants both Iran not to take over the Middle East and is afraid that Turkey is trying to hegemonize the Eastern Basin of the Mediterranean. So what we have today, the good guys and bad guys, 
are the following. The bad guys are Iran and Syria, Turkey, Qatar, and Hamas. And you have, uh, in addition to it, also the Mediterranean scene, where the bad guy is Turkey and Libya, the, the Libyan government, that are trying to cordon off the Eastern Mediterranean. And here you have different allies for the United States more than you have in the Persian Gulf. So on the American side, the good guys are the United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the Gulf states, Jordan, Morocco. But if you add the Eastern Mediterranean, you also have Cyprus and Greece, and again, Egypt. And again, different countries are afraid both from Iran and from Syria, because it's not only the direct Iranian threat, you also have the Muslim Brothers. And the Muslim Brothers are threatening the Sisi regime in Egypt. And the Muslim Brothers are threatening the Abdullah regime, the Hashemite regime in Jordan, because the strongest opposition in Jordan is a combination of Palestinians and Muslim Brothers. And they're also threatening Egypt concerning its gas deposits in the Mediterranean, and also from Libya. So you have a very large coalition. And when inside this coalition you can create alliances and people get along inside the coalition, this is very important and this is exactly what is happening today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow in Washington. You're bringing together Israel and the Emirates, Bahrain would not have joined it were it not for the Saudis approving it. So Saudi Arabia is indirectly connected. And the better the relations inside this alliance of America, Israel, the Sunni Arab states, Greece, and um, Cyprus, the stronger it is against the threats of um, Iran and, uh, and Turkey. Last but not least, it would be a mistake to try to engage America in the Middle East militarily. The American people have no appetite for it, but if you strengthen your allies, if you strengthen Israel and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and the other states that I've uh, mentioned in the Middle East, you will be strengthening the ability of people in the region to do their own fighting against Iran and against Turkey, primarily against Iran at the moment. And the moment Americans will try to appease um, the Iranians again, we will find the Middle East dramatically being destabilized so a lot depends on persisting with the existence, existing policy of maximum pressure on Iran and supporting the local allies of the United States in the region. Let me perhaps stop here and open the floor for any questions or comments that you may have. Wonderful, thank you so much. We have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, going on your last point, would it be desirable to support Kurdistan in this environment? Yes, uh, for two reasons. A, because the Kurds have been given a very bad deal in the Middle East. It's a big people basically willing to defend itself, willing to become a productive, stable element in the region. So this is one reason. The other reason is it's bad for Erdogan, and whatever is bad for Erdogan, I think is good for the region. Now, don't misunderstand me. There can be a different Turkey. We used to have a different Turkey. In Turkey, we have, I don't know, something like a third of the population who are people who could become a very moderating, important factor in the region. So I'm speaking about challenging Erdogan not challenging Turkey, because the problem both in Iran and in Turkey is the regime. 
in the long run, I think Israel and Iran have the best chances in the Middle East to be successful because you have such a strong Iranian society. Turkey, with this third of the society I spoke about, can come in under a different regime. And other states in the region can only benefit from it, having a much more stable region. Along that line, do you think that Turkey will revert back to a secular Turkey and become a major player? I don't know, because what we had in Turkey, and that's very interesting, we had two cultural revolutions in one century. The problem is that the majority of the Turkish society actually supports Erdogan. My guess is that even if he would not have rigged the elections, he could have had a majority, perhaps not the kind of majority as today, an absolute majority, but I don't see anybody else today challenging him. The question is economic. If you can see to it that Erdogan's economy is undermined, I think that this will help those elements in Turkey who will seek more uh, stability in the region, who will not try to undermine other regimes, who will not try to dominate the Eastern Mediterranean, who can be more open to compromises. And uh, I hope this will happen. Understood. And you were talking about the threat from Iran and, and how we should be supporting local players there. But if Iran tries to break out and build a nuclear bomb, do you think either Israel or U.S. should act militarily to stop them? We should have to see what will happen if and when this happens. Uh, first of all, the question is, where will Russia and China be because both on the one hand want to undermine American policy, but on the other hand are not interested in a, in a nuclear Iran either. So it depends on what kind of a global arrangement can be done because just the military action will set them back. But the question is, will it, um, will it be sustainable? I am not sure. It is much better to encourage regime change. Of course, we must say hypocritically that this is not what we're trying. I mean, I wouldn't admit it if I were the president of the United States, but whatever is bad for Iran today is good for the future of the Middle East. So the weaker Iran is, the weaker, the more it must pay for what it does in the region, the better. And if it works with the change of regime, not only do we not have to continue to act against Iran, it may become the most important ally after Israel in the region for the United States. Thank you. Can you expand upon how you see the Iranian and Turkish Arab relations after the peace agreements between the Arab countries and Israel? Well, they're both outraged for a good reason, because this is the coalition that is essentially anti-Iranian and to somewhat uh, lesser extent anti-Turkish. So, of course, they're against it. They, they will call them traitors. And remember, we're speaking about two countries, particularly Iran, that will not shy away from using terrorism, particularly Iran. I don't think there has ever been a state that had a global network of terrorist, terrorism infrastructure, like Iran. I want to remind everybody that they uh, tried to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington, D.C. We are speaking of a country that has an infrastructure in Latin America, in, in Asia. Wherever you look, they have an, a, a terrorist infrastructure, so they may use proxies. They're very good when it comes to using proxies. Understood. Um, in the event of a Biden administration, do you think they will go back to Obama's approach or continue a harder line? I don't know, but what is happening today in the Democratic Party doesn't leave much place for hope. And I am afraid that they will again join forces with the Europeans and do the worst possible uh, thing that you can namely to try to negotiate with Iran. Anything that the Iranian regime agrees to 
is ipso facto bad and dangerous for the other side. If they agree to something, it means that we have been given a raw deal. They're very good negotiators. The guy the United States sent in order to uh, negotiate with the smartest negotiators in the world was well, John Kerry. So you can imagine the, uh, the outcome. And the Iranians will promise you whatever they want because as long as you let them, we focus just on the nuclear issue. But the bomb is an instrument. Even a nuclear arsenal is not the objective. It is just to give them immunity so that they can use other means under the radar. So even if they're willing to accept something on the nuclear issue, remember by far the most important problem is their attempt to hegemonize the Middle East. This will have a major effect on the global balance of power. Europe will not be safe if Iran hegemonizes the Middle East. Imagine they have the control not, over, not only over the oil in the region, but also over Mecca. Uh, you, but the Europeans cannot uh, be taken seriously. They don't take themselves seriously. They're not willing to do anything to defend themselves. And therefore, we need to focus on what is really dangerous. We are focusing on the instrument rather than on the essence. So what do you think Trump should specifically do with Erdogan on Cyprus, Libya, and Hamas support? What does he trade? I'm sorry, I didn't get the beginning of the question. What should what? What should Trump do specifically? Um, with look, he needs to wake up concerning Erdogan. I think this is his one mistake, one major mistake in regional politics. He doesn't understand how dangerous Erdogan is, how dangerous the Muslim brothers are. The Muslim brothers are extremely dangerous because they have learned to pretend to be moderate. They have learned, look at what happened with Erdogan himself. When he came to power in 2003 or 2002, I don't remember exactly, he seemed to be just another guy. And, and the idea was, here is finally a moderate Muslim. This is what the Muslim brothers specialize in. They are as radical as you can possibly get, but smart enough to hide it. We are very often focusing on the theatrics of radicalism, like beheadings of ISIS and so on, rather than looking at the substance. If God forbid Obama would have succeeded and the Muslim brothers would have been in power in Egypt, the whole region would have been different. We could have been, we could have been facing now an Israeli-Egyptian war again. Egypt would be a catastrophe for the whole region. If Egypt would fall to the Muslim Brothers, Jordan could fall to the Muslim Brothers. And if you have a combination of Muslim Brothers in Turkey, Egypt, Jordan, the whole region would be in danger, in grave danger. So Trump needs to wake up about Saddam Hussein, I, I'm sorry, about uh, Erdogan, and understand that this guy is a major danger. And he's extremely vulnerable because once he is economically challenged, he may lose a lot of his support in Turkey. And we may get in Turkey a regime that you can talk to. Uh, again, with Turkey, do you think they should be stripped of the NATO status, considering Erdogan is going against peace? I wish, I wish, but I don't think the Europeans will uh, go for it, first of all, because it means uh, taking sides and the Europeans are trying to be nice to everybody. And they don't realize that the reason why we needed Turkey in the first place in NATO is not so uh, compelling today as it used to be. First of all, the idea was they have a very large army and we Europeans don't want to have many soldiers 
and frankly speaking, we don't care if Turks are killed. So they wanted a, this very large army. Today, A, the army is much less effective than it used to be because Erdogan destroyed its military leadership. Second, with Erdogan, you don't know on which side the army will be. Now remember, Erdogan was willing to take the S-400 from uh, Russia, which threatens the um, air superiority of NATO. So you have here somebody who can very easily be on the other side. I don't expect the Europeans to take any step that they actually need. They haven't done it for a very long time, and I don't think that it will work. But if Israel were a part of NATO, I would instruct my people in NATO not to give NATO anything, assuming the enemy gets it. Okay, because once the Turks have it, as far as I'm concerned, the other side has it. I wouldn't trust anything concerning Turkey under Erdogan. Again, there is a different Turkey. There is a society in Turkey that is very impressive, that could be worked with in a very good way, could be a good ally, but not the Turkey of Erdogan. So in terms of regional actors, do you see any willingness of the Gulf states to openly challenge Iran militarily, or would they only rely on an American or perhaps Israeli umbrella? Look, the very fact that they're politically willing to do what they're doing now is a major assistance to uh, Israel and the United States. You, you don't need um, Bahrain to attack Iran. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, we're speaking about a very a small country. The United Arab Emirates are much more impressive than they look, but again, they're not a match alone against Iran. That's why the alliance is so important. When you bring in Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Israel and the United States with the political support of others, when you bring in the fact that you can compensate for oil shortages by um, increasing the production in, um, in Saudi Arabia. When you can do many things that are not necessarily mil military, you are assisting those whose strengths are in the military field. So here you have an alliance where different countries contribute different assets to the overall alliance. Is there any sign or hope of the Muslim Brotherhood losing some of its power? Where? In general. Well, unfortunately, the moment they have taken hold of Turkey, they have an enormously important base. But the fact that they lost Egypt to Sisi was the difference between them being a determining factor of the Middle Eastern history of today and not being. Sisi did us all an enormous favor by kicking out the Muslim brothers. And I'm not surprised that under Obama, they actually encouraged it on the assumption that this is a product of democracy. And do you have any parting remarks on, on, how, um, on how the European nations could possibly get involved in this? Look, Europe has abdicated from history and uh, they, they're a very nice museum. This is the second largest economy, very rich, very successful with a great um, uh, quality of life, with an enormous achievement on so many different things and their impact on the global scene is marginal, sometimes even negligible, because they believe that soft power alone is enough. They believe that speaking softly works without carrying a big stick. And this is ridiculous. And if you look at some of the most important differences today, you will find that the Europeans are working with Iran against the United States, 
with the Russian uh, economic interest in trying to dominate the energy scene in Europe against the United States. Some elements, uh, when it comes to technology, working with China in something that is objectively against the interest of the United States. So the Europeans cannot be trusted. In the Middle East, I can tell you uh, that Europe is not trusted by anybody, not by its friends and not by the countries they criticize because they're not willing to put a punch behind their words, to, to be willing to engage in something to the point where their engagement can be meaningful. Here and there you have exceptions. At the moment, for instance, the French are backing the Greeks and the Cypriots against the uh, Turkish attempt to dominate the Eastern Mediterranean. But uh, with the French, it's only a question of time until they change sides. So I wouldn't trust that either. All right. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Shuftan, for speaking with us today. Thank you. Uh, for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for our weekly update with Ashley Perry. As a reminder, we will not be hosting a webinar on Friday this week. Thank you all again for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.